Merry Christmas, everyone. We would like to extend a warm welcome to every member of each of our six congregations and anyone who's worshipping with us for, very, for the very first time to Hope Church's online service. I'm Mama Tara. My name is Emmy. I'm Myra. And I'm Yemi. And we're all part of the Overton congregation. Mama Tara will now read to us from Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice. From that time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. And we pray that the peace of God will rule in our hearts and our homes as we worship together. Amen. 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 Good morning, Hope Church. I'm David, I'm from the Alpington congregation. Just wanted to say a few thoughts. It's Christmas time, Advent time. It's times when we think about knowing him and uh, we're excited, excited to learn about the things that he did, how he was born in a manger, how the wise men came to worship him. But I want us to just flip it just for a moment. He knows you. <laughs> the joy of the gospel is not just that we know him, but that he knows us. Today, during the worship, as you listen to the message, as we learn about him, don't forget he knows us. He knows when you were born. He knows how you were born. He knows every moment of your life and he loves you. He knows what you had for breakfast. If you're watching this this morning, in you know, the morning, you're, he knows what you had for breakfast. If you're watching it in the middle of the night, he knows what your day was like. We talk in the scriptures, it talks about, you know, he knows the numbers of hairs on your head. But how about he knows the number of hours that you've watched on Netflix in the last day, last week, last month. He knows you. He loves you. He loves you so much that he was born to die. But just for a few moments this morning, instead of thinking about knowing him, reflect on the fact that he knows us. He knows all our good points. He knows all our bad points. He knows everything we've messed up, things that we feel that we can never recover from, maybe. He knows. He understands. And he loves. He is love. He knows everything about us. He knows the things he's put inside us. He knows the gifts, the talents, the incredible dream that he has for our lives when he created us. So let's just think on those things as we get excited about opening the presents and getting to know more about him and his story. Don't forget, he knows about us. He knows us and he knows our story. He knows every single thing about us and he loves us. Have an amazing time this morning. From the realms of glory, bring your flight o'er all the earth. We who sang creation's story now proclaim Messiah's birth. Come, come and worship, worship Christ the Oh 
the Savior of the world. Christ is come. Christ is born. He has come to rescue us. The Son of God revealed in the flesh. He has come to save us. Yeah. 
is the Lord Christ, Christ is, is the Lord Oh, praise is His name His power and glory More proclaim Just as this year comes to an end, we thought it would be good to catch up with uh, Mike Cook, who was our administrator, uh, and then left us right at the beginning of the year to go work with another church. Mike, it's great to see you today, uh, great to catch up. Obviously, it's been a bit of a weird year, uh, not the one you imagined or I did, but maybe you could just tell us a little bit about where you are now and what you're involved in. Well, hi, Tony. It's a real pleasure to see you again and a great pleasure to be chatting to you as well. So thank you. Thank you for contacting me and thank you for asking me to let you know how things are going. As you say, it has been a really strange year. Um, I, I, I plan to come up here and serve a gateway church in Wrexham uh, as of the beginning of this year. And I'd plan to put my house um, on the market to get it rented out to tenants in order to support myself for the year and for the at least for another year or two anyway. But of course, just as I put it onto the market, we went into lockdown and that put things really on hold. However, by the grace of God, things did work out. I do have tenants, they moved in in mid-July. I'd meanwhile been looking for flats here in Wrexham, completely failed. There's a series of really weird happenings that seemed to block me each, in different ones each time. And I did ask God, you know, what's going on? But as it turned out, Ruth and Paul Barrett, who used to lead Gateway, used to lead Jubilee in Croydon, asked me if I'd like to come and lodge with them. And I did do. And I'm so glad that I did. It, it's a lovely being here. And out of, out of the window, which I can see as I look, as I look to my left here, you can't see, but I have a vision of about, uh, a view of about 40 miles over the Cheshire Plains, right into the Peak District. So it, so we, we, I live at Funnan Farm. Funnan is Welsh for well, and it's halfway up the side of Hope Mountain. And so we're, we're in Kamai, which is just outside Wrexham. So we really are in the hills of North Wales, and there's like rivers and streams running all over the place. Whenever we step out of the house here, out of the farm, it's either very steeply up or sharply down so for me that's great because i like walking and i like jogging and that's all good for the heart rate <clears throat> i did start uh, another apart from coming to serve the church here 
I did start with St. Politus, which is an Anglican theological college. That started in September and I've just completed my first term and only last week got in an essay. It is challenging. It really is hard work and it's tiring. Uh, I'm also studying New Testament Greek, um, but I'm so glad that I am. It's a real privilege to be doing so. And it's a spirit-filled, Christ-centered college. And um, yeah, I, even after my first term, I can see that I've learned so much, even though at times some of it seemed to be so challenging to me. That's great, Mike, to hear you're back studying. And uh, I know you're going to do really well at that. Obviously, it's Christmas time. I just was interested in um, what Christmas normally looks like for you and your family. Have you got any plans for this year? Well, at Christmas, for the past few years, I've normally spent it with my children. Either they've come to stay with me or I've gone to stay with them. And God willing, I really hope that the same thing happens again this year. I've been invited back down to Hampshire, where I used to live, to go and stay with my son, John, and his partner, Beth. They've got a, a new house just on the outskirts of Basingstoke. Um, by my eldest daughter, Helen, uh, who's coming down from Durham just to come and stay with us too. So I'm really looking forward to that, and I do hope, uh, as I'm sure many of us around the country are hoping, I hope that it actually happens. John and Beth have acquired a, a black and white cocker spaniel called Wilson, who I thought was named after Wilson the dog on Friday, Friday night dinners, but apparently not. But I think he's the one that really rules the house there. So I'm looking forward to meeting him and uh, playing with him. And I've no doubt that on Boxing Day, provided all goes to plan, we'll go down to West Wittering Beach in Sussex and uh, throw sticks and just have, have a good time as a family together. So that's really what I'm looking forward to. But at the end of the day, if it doesn't happen, well, I'm sure I'll have a nice Christmas if we're here with Paul and Ruth. And whatever happens, it'd just be good just to take five days out, forget about everything else, and just relax. And... Uh, I hope the same is true for you and your family as well. Thanks, Mike. I guess, yeah, like you, it's uh, uncertain Christmas time. I, I do pray that you get to see your family, uh, although I know uh, they will look after you very well in Wrexham. Um, just lastly, I uh, just want to ask, how can we be praying for you and particularly for the church in Wrexham, uh, who we know really well? Uh, what can we do in remembering you? Well, but for Gateway Church here in Wrexham, we really want to get back to having church meetings again, starting this coming January. So please pray for that. And Funan, as I say, I live in Funan Farm. We believe that's prophetic because Funan means well. And re we also really want an outpouring of God's Holy Spirit this year. We crave God's Spirit more than anything because when we're in that, flow as it were we know that we are heading in the right way for me personally the studies are a challenge there are i won't go into the details but there are some challenges for my second year especially so i do pray for god please pray that i would have the energy and ability just to pursue those studies as i ought and that um yeah just for I would use my energies, my time would be used in the way God wants them to be used for as long as I've got them to use. Um, if I may now, Tony, I'd just like to read out a blessing over you, over your family, and over everyone that can hear me. So this is from Numbers chapter 6. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Thanks, Mike, for that. I just want to pray for you. Lord God, thank you for Mike. Thank you for uh, the ministry he had with us. And now as it continues to grow in Wrexham, we pray for his safety, for his family, and for the church uh, there on the borders of Wales. Lord, we say, may your name be glorified over this Christmas season. God bless you, Mike. I uh, pray you have a happy Christmas and a great new year. Hello, I'm Marcos. I'm going to read from Isaiah 59. 
Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear. For your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he will not hear. For your hands are stained with blood, your fingers with guilt, your lips have spoken falsely, and your tongue mutters wicked things. No one calls for justice, no one pleads a case with integrity. They rely on empty arguments that they utter lies. They conceive troubles and give birth to evil. They watch the eggs of vipers and spin a spider's web. Whoever eats their eggs will die. And when one is broken, another is hatched. Their cobwebs are useless for clothing. They cannot cover themselves with what they make. Their deeds are evil deeds and acts of violence are in their hands. Their feet rush into sin. They are swift to shed innocent blood. They pursue evil schemes. Acts of violence mark their ways. The way of peace they do not know. There is no justice in their paths. They have turned them into crooked roads. No one who walks along them will know peace. So justice is far from us, and righteousness does not reach us. We look for light, for all is darkness, for brightness, for we all walk in deep shadows, like the blind we grope along the wall, feeling our way like people without eyes. At midday, we stumble as if it were twilight. Among the strong, we are like dead. We all growl like bears and mourn mournfully like doves. We look for justice, but find none, for deliverance, but it's far away. For our offenses are many in your sight, and our sins testify against us. Our offenses are ever with us, and we acknowledge our iniquities, rebellion and treachery against the Lord, turning our backs on our God, inciting revolt and oppression, uttering lies our hearts have conceived. So justice is driven back, and righteousness stands at a distance. Truth has stumbled in the streets. Honesty cannot enter. Truth is nowhere to be found, and whoever shuns evil becomes a prey. The Lord looked and was displeased that there was no justice. He saw that there was no one. He was appalled that there was no one to intervene. So his own arm achieved salvation for him, and his own righteousness sustained him. He put on righteousness as his breastplate and the helmet of salvation on his head. He put on the garments of vengeance and wrapped himself in zeal as in a cloak. According to what they have done, so he will repay wrath to his enemies and retribution to his foes. He will repay the islands their due. For from the west people will fear the name of the Lord and from the rising of the sun they will revere his glory. For he will come like a pent up flood that the breath of the Lord drives along. The Redeemer will come to Zion, to those in Jacob who repent of their sins, declares the Lord. As for me, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord. My spirit, who is on you, will not depart from you, and my words that I have put in your mouth will always be on your lips, on the lips of your children and on the lips of the descendants, for this time and on forever, says the Lord.
Welcome Hope Church and welcome to you if you're joining us online today. It's great to have you with us. We're going to be looking at uh, Isaiah chapter 59 verses 1 to 21. Um, I just want to say it's a real privilege to come and share God's word with you today. And as we continue in this Advent season, um, I want to speak to us about the plan. Last week, Amy spoke to us so well about the promise of God. She took us right back to the beginning of Genesis, where she spoke to us from creation and how we were made for God. We heard about the promises of God and the the hope that they bring to our lives. And I guess the Christmas story, after all, is a hope story. Back in Genesis, we heard about hope created. We heard about hope that was lost. And today I want to share how God unfolds his sovereign plan to bring about hope restored. You could say that as human beings, we are all hardwired to hope. There's something that hope does in us and, and it motivates us. It fuels us. All of our experiences are really stories of hope. Like many of you, when I came to know Jesus for the first time for myself, I experienced his wonderful peace and forgiveness. It brought such a hope. And as I was baptised in the Holy Spirit, this extraordinary encounter brought about such a deep assurance of hope. Even though life was quite messy, it was for the first time that I felt completely secure in this future hope that I belonged to him and he belonged to me. His plan to rescue me came just at the right time. And I want to encourage you today that God's timing is perfect. And that as God spoke life to me, as he shared this great eternal hope that began to shape my life, I believe God wants to speak into your heart this morning and to shape the rest of your life. And if you don't know him this morning and if you know he's speaking to you, I want to encourage you, do not harden your heart but be open to what God wants to say to you as well today. We have a wonderful hope in Jesus Christ. And the Christmas story is a good news story of hope. All of our good news of great times, they're all stories of hope being fulfilled. And I guess uh, you could say that some of our worst and our saddest times in our lives are stories where hope gets deferred or gets lost along the way. Before I came to know Jesus, I looked for hope and I looked for significance in all kinds of ways, in all kinds of areas. And I'm sure you can imagine. But I guess not, it wasn't that I particularly thought about it at the time. I wasn't thinking about I was looking for hope and significance and assurances. But it's only that as I look back, I realise that is what I was doing. And I can tell you that because there was so much in my life that frustrated me. There were many times where I felt complete disappointment. Things that I put my hope and trust in just didn't deliver or I'd come away just feeling unfulfilled, more and more empty, more and more hard-hearted as these things didn't deliver as I thought they would or should or that they might have done. You know, even as a child of God, we can get distracted. If you're a Christian this morning, we can all be tempted to look and to place our ultimate hope into other things, into other areas of our lives. We can quite easily lose sight or look away from our future hope, especially when things around us are really difficult. We can easily feel quite powerless in our present when we when we lose sight of our future hope. And the storms of life can easily overwhelm us when we lose sight of this wonderful hope. And you know what? It can keep us in a holding pattern like a revolving door in our lives, holding us back. And these tough moments, in these tough moments, we have an opportunity to decide in those moments, do we run to God or do we run from God? If you don't know Jesus today, I wonder where do you go? Where do you run to, to find your hope, to find your significance? Have you ever asked your question, where you go to find your security in life? If you're struggling in particular today, I want to share with you the story of God's great plan of hope. 
Isaiah 59 uh, verses 1 to 21. I'm not going to read them all out today. I want to encourage you to go away and read them. But I want to share a few passages from this great chapter of hope. And this is a great chapter of hope because it is written in a very dark moment. For Israel, this is one of their darkest times in their history. It's a time of utter hopelessness. The context here in Isaiah 59 is that the people of Israel, they've come home to Jerusalem. They've uh, come home following a time of being in in exile and uh, in captivity in Babylon. And as they come home to Jerusalem, they realise the complete place is in utter chaos. There's a real mess. Jerusalem has uh, no city walls and so there's a real vulnerability for the people of Israel. There's no central government. There's no local authority. There's no temple. And so godlessness is becoming more and more frequent. And their, their whole society, their whole community is one of anarchy and chaos. Violence is on the increase. Poverty is on the increase. It's a complete social breakdown. These are dark times tough times for the people of Israel. And you know, in difficult times, it's very easy to lose hope. It's easy. In fact, it's often in hardship and suffering that we discover where our true hope is. It somehow comes out. I wonder this morning, where are you? Where do you run? Where do you look to for your hope? In a covid situation in a pandemic where is your hope this morning in verse 1 Isaiah speaks and says to the people surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save nor his ear too dull to hear in our passage there was a rumbling of complaint there was a, uh, a, a, a people who were struggling and looking to pass blame. And Isaiah deals with this right from the very first verse of chapter 59. You know, when we're struggling, we can wonder, can't we? We can all do it. We can doubt and we can even accuse God and say, God, where are you in this? We can doubt his goodness. We can even blame him for our troubles and our situations. But Isaiah here in this passage where the people are beginning to do exactly that addresses this issue with them to the people of Israel who are shaking their heads and waving their fists and wondering where God is. God who seems to have turned his back completely and Isaiah says no this is a false charge. This is not right. God is not without power. He is not hard of hearing. His arm isn't too short to rescue you. Isaiah wants them to know that God is not the problem. And we were reminded last week that God is not the problem. He is the promise. And he doesn't just have a plan. He is the plan. And in verse 2, we find that part of God's plan is for the people of God here in this passage to realise that the problem, the very problem that they are facing is in themselves. It's not something out there and external. The problem was within them. In verse 2, Isaiah says to them, your sin has separated you. He says the relationship has been broken. And in verses 2 through to verse 8, and you can read these, you'll find Isaiah outlines this problem in more detail. It's just a, 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 an outline of God's divine indictment against his people. And this wasn't just true for the people of Israel. In this particular point of history, this crosses every culture, every nation, across every period of time, right into our world today, this issue of sin that separates. These verses speak into all kinds of rebellion and selfishness and greed and the lies and the violence that are taking place in this nation and how they foolishly really try to cover it up or try to justify their actions or attempted in vain to make up for the wrong things that they had done by trying to balance the scales by doing something that was maybe more noble 
or that God might look at and be impressed with. And then we get to verse 9 in Isaiah chapter 59. And it's a really important few verses from verse 9 to 15. Here Israel, uh, they come to an important realisation, an important revelation of the problem for themselves. And it leads them to some honest self-assessment. They come to a place of realisation and a confession. It's, it's a kind of turning point for them as they begin to realise that they can't blame God, but they can run to him. They get this revelation that actually I am the problem. I fall short. It's my heart that's hard. It's our heart that's rebellious. We are self-centred. It's that that has broken this friendship or even a sense of God's reality in their life. And it's a challenge for us all, whether you're a Christian or not. I want to challenge you, you know, where do you run? Do you doubt and ignore and run somewhere else when the storms of life come? Or do you run to him? For God's people in our passage today, they had this moment, this penny drop moment when the reality hit home. And in verse 9, Isaiah says, we look for light, but all is darkness. For our offences are many in your sight and it's our sins that testify against us. It's our offences that are ever with us and we acknowledge our iniquities, rebellion and treachery against the Lord, turning our backs on our God. And although this must have been humbling for them, this realisation, this revelation, this confession in their time of utter hopelessness was the doorway to hope. And what unfolds before them in their hearing through Isaiah in verses 15 to 20 is God begins to reveal his plan to rescue them, to redeem them and to restore hope. In verse 20, Isaiah declares the word of the Lord. He says, the Redeemer will come from Zion to those in Jacob who repent of their sins, declares the Lord. As for me, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord. My spirit who is on you will not depart from you. And my words that I have put in your mouth will always be on your lips, on the lips of your children and on the lips of their descendants from this time on and forever, says the Lord. God knew there was no one on earth who could intervene. There was no one who could restore hope. And so his promise and his plan was for God to come himself. He unfolds this plan, this wonderful sovereign intervention to rescue Israel, that one would come who will be full of justice and full of mercy, full of truth and grace, making payment for sin and bringing this free gift of salvation for sinners. And now for us, in this season of Advent, the same hope, the same truth, the same rescue plan, the same Redeemer wants to come and save the likes of me and you. That we can today look back on this wonderful uh, 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 time where the Redeemer came in the person of Jesus Christ. We can look back and celebrate the one who created the heavens and the earth, who perfectly followed the plan. This wonderful God who sent his one and only son that whoever would believe in him, whoever would trust him, would not perish but have everlasting life. That means all of humanity can now know this great future hope that brings a complete transformation and a significance to your life and purpose to your life and meaning into your life right now in the present today. Jesus Christ gave his own life on the cross as a ransom for us. This baby who came born in a manger, born of a virgin, came with a plan and a purpose to ransom humanity, to bring about new life. He came not to just be the promise, but also to be the plan. That he would become like us, that we might become like him. 
God is still rescuing souls today. His plan is still as relevant today as it was thousands of years ago. And he wants to bring this amazing, life-changing, eternal hope that will never perish, that is unfading, that is guarded by God himself in glory. He wants to bring that to you today. You see, Israel realised their own sin and they ran to God in humility. And as they confessed and called on him, he was faithful to them. He was faithful to them. And we can come to God because of what Jesus has done for us. We can receive this amazing hope, a hope for eternity. You know, someone once described the cross of Jesus Christ as a kiss of justice and grace. And because of this wonderful grace, this undeserved favour of God, anyone now can be rescued. God's great plan of salvation can utterly change any life. Not by turning over a new leaf or or having a New Year's resolution to try harder and perform better in life. That doesn't matter. Because of Jesus, we can come exactly as we are. And we can find this wonderful hope that transforms our lives, that makes us into a brand new person, giving us a brand new start full of peace and purpose can start today. I want to encourage you, if you don't know him today, I'd love to pray for you right now. And if this is you, if you know God is speaking to you, if you have that self-realisation, you know you're not right with him, you can be right with him in a moment, just as you are. I'm going to pray and please feel free to join me and echo these words. Father God, I'm sorry for the things I've said and done wrong in my life that have hurt both myself and others and where my sin has separated me from you. Today I ask, please forgive me. I now turn from everything that I know is wrong and I want to turn to you for help and hope. Thank you that you sent your son to die on the cross for me so that I could be forgiven. And because he rose from the dead, I can now know true freedom. Thank you that you forgive me. Thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit which I now receive, please come into my life and help me to know, love and follow you forever. Amen. I want to encourage you today to tell somebody, if you prayed that prayer for the first time, if you've responded today, I'd love to know about it. If you'd love someone to pray with you, do get in touch with us. You can Get in touch with us at, uh, via our website, hopechurchuk.org. And you can begin right now opening up a Bible. Get the new uh, International Version Bible app and you can begin right now. And I'd recommend reading Mark's Gospel and start there. And I'm sure you will have lots of questions and I pray you will have lots of encounters with God. And my encouragement to you is keep going. There is so much more that God has got in store for you in these days. You can know a wonderful future hope that is full of purpose. God's plan for your life is to give you a hope and a future. Amen. God bless. Merry Christmas. And I hope to see you soon.
Thank you, Pete, for that wonderful preach. We hope you've been blessed by God's word this morning. We hope you'll be able to join us at 4 p.m. on Christmas Eve for our children's nativity service on YouTube. And we also hope that you'll join us online at 9.45 a.m. on Christmas Day for our Christmas service. Thank you for joining us. God bless you. Bye. Bye. Yeah.